Welcome to the Dublin Tech Summit. It's great to be here. First time in Dublin. Uh, it's, it's, it's a charming city. It really is. And I look forward to taking a, a Guinness later this evening at a, a local pub. Get the real vibe. And the summit so far has been great. I've heard a lot of interesting talks and uh, looking at a few this afternoon. Great. Me and you will sort that out. I'll bring you to the good spots later. I have a mission to make first before we start, just to get it off my chest. I'm a fully paid up customer and fan of Epidemic. Very happy to hear that. I hope you're enjoying the service and that you're not getting blocked anywhere. Yes. Uh, what drew me to you a couple of years ago was actually your tagline, soundtrack the world. What does that mean? Well, it kind of means that what should have been the most fun process of every content creation production, putting the music on at the end and just enhancing those feelings and uh, making the, the, the video really pop, uh, was the most complicated and cumbersome part of any content production part because you had to be a copyright lawyer just to even understand how you're allowed to use the music in which territories, on which devices, and it was just a hassle. So we said, roughly 12 years ago, we said, well, let's soundtrack the world the way we think the world is going to work in the future. How do you do that? How do you look into the future? Because great idea, but I'm sure extremely complicated to execute. Yeah, it is, it is very complicated. Uh, I think a, a good example is I've been, I've been nerding out on this uh, Cold Heart Pnow remix for the last couple of weeks, and, and I know it's, it's a little late, but still, I still like it. Uh, and just looking at that track, I was like, oh, I wonder if I could use this in anything. So I just go into my Spotify account and I look at who, who made it, and it's eight separate songwriters, and it's a label, and they all have their own publishers, and they all have their uh, own collecting societies. And I was just like, this would cost me a, a million just to get started hiring the lawyers that could eventually clear this for me. So, so it, it was just, um, it was so difficult to use music. So we just said a long time ago, um, let's skip actually producing content and start making music instead, but try and build a new music industry that actually works with the way we think that the future of content creation is going to look like. And that's going to be decentralized. Everybody's going to be able to make a video on their, uh, at the time, we thought digital cameras because they were cool and they were getting video capabilities. But thanks Apple and Samsung and everyone else for actually putting it in all the phones. So now everybody can make content on the fly, publish on the go. And the common denominator amongst all of these hundreds of millions of content creators is that none of them are copyright lawyers. So it needs to be really easy. And then when it's up there on your 10 platforms that you post on, uh, you can build a following, you can monetize if, if the platform allows it, you can get gifts on Twitch or whatever you want. And uh, it's not taken down and you don't get copyright strikes and you don't have to deal with all of that hassle. How do you even start to build a project that big? Well, you do it like one by one. Uh, we started way smaller. so. so we started with just broadcasters. And since we built uh, sort of a alternative music industry, our customers didn't have to pay a bunch of performance fees to the co local collecting societies. So, so that was a little win. But the only reason we did that was we were trying to find scale without tech. So uh, I've heard so many talks here uh, during, uh, during yesterday and today. And everybody's talking about scale being the one most important thing for your company. But if you don't have any devs, you're like a, an old lawyer like me and a management consultant uh, who was our CEO and then a bunch of music producers, you can't really build a product or develop things. So I know, today, I guess we would call them super spreader events. That was what we were trying to do. So we would help them save money. But the only reason we did that was because we knew that they would force the production companies to use our music when they were producing content. And then we knew that in the production companies, everybody's a freelancer. So those producers would be forced to use our tool, learn our service, understand how good it was, and then go to the next production company and the next one. So we were trying to like, build virality and, and scale, if you will, uh, by trying to do like, the means we had at our disposal. 
from what I understand, you had no marketing people for the first couple of years? For the first 10 years, we had no marketing whatsoever. Uh, we, I think that in retrospect, it was probably a big mistake. Uh, we would have been way more uh, known if we would have. But I think, yeah, we see a dynamic now where pretty much nobody knows who we are or knows our name, but everybody has heard us, probably even today. But they don't really know that it's us. Yeah. So across the millions of YouTubers and, and, snap, and snappers and, and TikTokers and everyone that uses our music to the hundreds of thousands of enterprises and SMBs, we, we also power all the tools that people use every day. So if, you, if you've ever used Canva, that's 100% us. If you've ever used Pinterest to make a video, that's 100% us. If you've used Getty Images or iStock, that's all us. And so, so we, we integrated with all these tooling systems, but we never told anybody because we figured when we're big enough and nobody can catch, uh, catch us, we'll, we'll tell people that we exist. And, so it's actually and like, a cunning ploy. Yeah, may, maybe that's now. <laughs> and then we also did, uh, we're probably the biggest label in the world when it comes to what we call contextual music. So if you've ever listened to Deep Focus or Peaceful Piano, Baby Sleep, all those kinds of lists across uh, Spotify, Apple Music, and Amazon, it's, it's all us. Wow. So, so everybody's probably heard it, but they just didn't know that it was us. You have a world first. It's not just played here on Earth. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was one of the things that was really complicated in the beginning because since licensing was so complex, it was, it was because there were so many different stakeholders and everybody was claiming to, to represent the, uh, the songwriters or the artists. So you had the labels, the publishers, the mechanical licensing societies, collecting societies, and, and, and everyone else. So we actually tried to work with them in the beginning. Because you have to remember, in 12 years ago, th there were two really famous Swedish music companies, and none of them was Spotify. They were called Pirate Bay, and they were called LimeWire. And they were really successful. But they were killing the entire music industry because they were, everybody was becoming so good at pirating. And then, obviously, eventually, Spotify solved that for popular music and, and that kind of market. Uh, but still, there was nowhere to go for B2B. So we said, oh, OK, well, what if we think completely different around copyrights in music and treat it like any other copyright in the world? So a lot of people here write code. And if you do, it's a copyright every time you do. But you sell it automatically through your salary to your employer every time you, you leave work, pretty much. And articles is the same thing. You write a popular article, a million people read it, doesn't necessarily mean that you get a rev share in the Wall Street Journal. But that was how music worked. And we said, we're not even sure if musicians want this. It, want it to be a lottery every time, because let's face it, most tracks aren't hits. So you don't get royalties from all these places uh, across the world, because nobody actually listened to the track. So we said, how about we pay for it? and you can't be members of all these societies, and we'll just do a direct transaction, and then we'll pay you based on the popularity of the track one more time, if it does really well. So that's what we did, and one of the benefits coming to the, the really, really wide licenses was that we owned everything. So we didn't have geo-blocking problems, we didn't have territory problems at all. So one of my pitches, I was, uh, as, as, as usual, it was for a production company. I didn't know who they were working for at the time. I was like, yeah, the, the licenses are so broad. We'll give you worldwide on all these platforms, and this is the price. And they're just like, yeah, that's going to be a problem for us. So wh what do you mean? How can that be a problem for you? Like, usually people just clap and are happy. <laughs> and he said, well, it's, it's uh, the client's NASA, and we're doing it up at the space station in ISS. So could you, could you actually write an intergalactic music license? I was just like, yes, this is finally. I've always wanted to write the broadest license possible, and, and that was the opportunity to do it. We've made it. We've made it. Yeah. You bring me nicely onto the creator economy. Yeah. You are immersed in that. What are you seeing changing there? The last couple of years, it feels there's been a tipping point in the creator economy. What are you guys seeing at the forefront? Well, yeah, when we started out, there was no creator economy, mm -hmm. really. Uh, it's, it's developed over the last eight years or so. And the only thing you could do back then was do YouTube videos 
and then YouTube would set ads next to your video, and they would give you 55% of the revenues uh, if you had licensed everything that you used in your video correctly. Otherwise, the, uh, the copyright owner would just monetize it or claim it or throw you off the platform and give you a copyright strike. So looking now, I'd say that, well, you can sell your merch on YouTube or Spotify directly to your super fans. You can sell your concert tickets on Spotify too. You can uh, do celebrity shout outs and cameo. You can uh, get gifts on Twitch if you're a live streamer and play video games. Like there's just so many opportunities of monetizing. But what we really see, which is interesting, is that the power is really shifting towards the creators and away from the platforms and away from the big enterprise companies. So a great example is uh, we work a ton with TikTok. We, we have so many people posting content on TikTok. And they're moving more and more to long form because they want to open up that advertising vertical and, and to take some of the traffic that YouTube has historically owned. So what they do is they say, just use the TikTok tool and you get access to any song in the world. And you can just post it on your channel and everybody's happy and, and you can get a sliver from the creator fund if it's popular enough. However, what they fail to understand is that 90% of all of our users on TikTok create the video outside of TikTok. Ah. Because if you do it with TikTok, it's only on platform, which means that that content can't go to YouTube Shorts legally. You can't monetize it anywhere else. It's essentially just a moat that that specific platform built to keep people posting natively on their platforms. So we see that 90% go out. They use Video Leap or Beat Leap or Cap Cuts or wh whichever video editing tool they use. They make it there, and then they push it to 10 platforms because they're interested in gaining the maximum amount of followers, uh, monetizing in whichever way they can. They probably even don't know how yet. But as long as they keep that door open to monetize down the road across Facebook or Instagram or wherever it may be, they, they should have a right to do it. So what we're trying to do is to get as close as possible to the actual creators and see what needs they have rather than bundling into to Spotify or, or TikTok or YouTube. Any creators are there in the audience now. What trends and opportunities do you see for them? Yeah, just keep your eyes open in terms of monetization opportunities. I mean, there's... Um, I wouldn't try Cameo if I was an influencer, I don't think. <laughs> Uh, but everything else, uh, and just keep your eyes peeled because YouTube uh, will just launch features that, that will just fly under the radar. You don't even know that they exist. But with two clicks, you can create some really cool merch. You'll have a t-shirt. They ship globally. You make quite a lot of money out of it. You have some quirky tagline that you just ship out to your super fans. And it, and it works, but you have to try everything out. Uh, so, so, so I would just like go on to the creator uh, sections of each platform and, and see which tools they have. And I just Spotify alone. They're launching, they're launching creation features on a, on a weekly basis. OK. We've got to know each other a little bit better. I think we're yeah. close enough now. I need to ask you a very personal question. OK. How many times have you fired yourself? <laughs> I, I've, I've made myself redundant many, many times. It's, uh, it's a uh, kind of happened by accident, uh, but then it happened many, many times. Uh, so, so it all started with um, after, after we built the, uh, the licensing model and we figured out how this would really work well for broadcasters. I, was, I remember I was pitching uh, Viacom and they had a business and a legal affairs uh, executive and she was awesome. She was so smart. She was. She was the only one who really got it, and she was asking all the uncomfortable questions during the meeting, the only thing that I was trying to steer clear of. And after the meeting, I was just like, well, she was awesome. Uh, can I please offer you my job? And she actually accepted straight away. She's like, yeah, this is super exciting. <laughs> I'll give you my job. And I just had to like, transition into something else that was the best for the company at the time. So I transitioned into sales. And I started building uh, different kinds of subscriptions, not just for the broadcasters, but for podcasters and YouTubers and, and uh, corporates that were 
digitizing all of their manuals from like really big books to videos, because then the videos could be used in both Chile and Sweden and, and the US, and you didn't have a language barrier. So everything was going to, to video. So I was pitching the, uh, the head of sales for, for Happy Socks after a while, because we were trying to uh, soundtrack every Happy Socks store everywhere in the world. And I was fascinated, because I'm like, how come you're everywhere? I, I mean, it's just socks. Like, with pineapples and skulls. It's, it's not unique in any way. But everywhere I go, it's just happy socks, just happy yeah. socks. And he told me about this massive, intricate plan that he had built with UPS and DHL and how they were actually storing all of his socks for free if he would just sign up to certain quantities and da da da, and just like built this massive distribution net. So at the end of the meeting, I uh, offered him my job as head of sales because I was like, if you can sell something that generic to this many places and they keep coming back and just ordering socks from you, you deserve this job. And he, and he also accepted. And then I did the same thing with, uh, I built a big partnerships organization and I met someone from Rocket Internet. She was a, such a superstar and she had done the same thing that I had done, but much faster with much more stores. So I, was, I offered her my job. And, and so it goes. So, Anybody wants to be head of biz dev for Epidemic Sound, let me know. <laughs> Just give me a pitch and, and you'll get my job. But um, it's, it, it sounds more calculated than it was. And I realize that I'm in a luxurious position being an owner in a company as well because I knew that I would have another job. If I was a gun for hire C level, I would have never been able to just lift yeah. uh, the perspective and see like I'm mediocre compared to her. Like I can see that like objectively. Where does that self awareness come from though? Because that, that is very difficult. A lot of entrepreneurs I've met, they hold too tight. They take it too close and hold too tight. How are you able to get that perspective? I think if if you really, really want the company to succeed and you're really interested in making it worth as much as it can possibly be sometime in the future. I, I just need to get lost. I, I mean, like, <laughs> there are better people than me that can do this. So why should I stand in the way? Because of ego, because of these other things? I mean, I still get to stand, sit here on stage because, like, I was in, there in the beginning. <laughs> and this is the best part. <laughs> yeah, this is the best part. I mean, uh, they're working harder than, than I am now. I'm in Dublin. They're I'm stuck in the out. office. We're going for Guinness. Exactly, exactly. So, so I think, yeah, it's, it, it's not an easy thing to do. But if, if you are an owner, I think you have an obligation towards the company to put the best people in the right position, even if that means just being a senior advisor at the end of the day or just trying to give good advice where you can. But compromise on, on the employees and the best people and the best talents, I would never, I would never. I love that. No ego, all about the long journey. Before we wrap up, what's next for Epidemic? What is your next big goal? Well, the thing is, like we mentioned in the beginning, we didn't have marketing. So we've never really told anybody that we exist. So uh, Secrets out. <laughs> secrets out. Uh, so, so now we're going we're gonna to use this period of time, the, uh, the Sassaker or the startup enema or whatever we want to call this period of time that we all have to go through for the next 18 months or, or however long it takes. Uh, we'll use that to uh, localize our products into a ton of different languages. Uh, wait until capital allocators are back and they're hungry to, to, to get back in, into the game. And after that, all doors are open. I mean, IPO or anything else, or just continue as a, as a private company, we're keeping all those doors open. But for now, we're going to use the time to, to really double down on actually talking to our Spanish-speaking customers in Spanish, and the same in China and Germany and, and a bunch of different markets. Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me.